pray together. Lord, we're just grateful that uh, as we come into this room and we sit here today that we are not here alone, that you are with us. And Lord, I pray that uh, uh, you would be honored in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have a confession to make. Are you ready? Brace yourselves. I don't get Palm Sunday. I don't get, I don't get Palm Sunday in light of Good Friday. And I don't get Good Friday in light of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, the final time, and he did so with great praise and fanfare. The masses of people shouting, lauding him, King of the Jews, and proclaiming Hosanna, which in that moment meant blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. On Friday of this week, we will meet to reflect upon the day that not even one week later in Christ's life, when those same people changed their shouts of joyful Hosanna to angry words of crucify him. What happened? What happened? How could there be such a change of heart in just a few short days? <clears throat> it baffles my mind. It's baffled my mind for a long time. Here's where I've landed. The people didn't really know Jesus. They thought they did, but in actuality, he was not who they thought he was. And I believe that that is a big reason for the radical change of heart that week. For the past two years, I've been part of a community of Christian leaders from all over the country facilitated by an organization called the Transforming Center. About 80 of us meeting for quarterly retreats for the purpose of going deeper in our relationship with Jesus. This transforming community has as its purpose strengthening the souls of Christian leaders. And my two-year journey as part of this community actually ended uh, late this past fall. Being part of that community has had a pretty profound impact on my life as a follower of Jesus. I've been deeply challenged. I've been deeply encouraged. I have indeed gone deeper in my relationship with Jesus. And, and one of the things that I have discovered on that journey was just how much more of Jesus there is to discover. <clears throat> I've learned that after 30 plus years of following Jesus, <laughs> I haven't been as up close and personal with Jesus as I might have thought. And this discovery was both sobering and exciting. Getting to know Jesus, really knowing him up close and personal, is deeply connected to our spiritual growth. Deeply connected. In fact, unless we truly have a growing, accurate understanding of who Jesus is, we will be stunted in our growth. Stunted in our faith. 
on this Palm Sunday of 2016 is Jesus who you think he is? As we begin Holy Week, I wanted to take this opportunity to help us gaze through a three-paned window into the presence of Jesus of Nazareth. This three-paned window was actually something that I was encouraged with during my time as part of my transforming community. I deeply love Jesus. And these are just three of the many wonderful things that I've come to understand about him and that impress me so much about him. So would you look through this window with me today? First off, Jesus is a person of immense strength. Let's start and just reflect on his physical strength. Now, we have a number of carpenters who attend Emmanuel, people who could give us a decent idea of the possible stature and physique of Jesus. But when I think of a carpenter, my mind immediately goes to a guy that Christy and I have known for a little over 20 years. He attended the first church where I was on staff down in Elmhurst. And his name is Dane. And when I think about Jesus and what his physical stature might have been like, I think of Dane. Dane's a gifted carpenter who actually specializes in masonry. And he's done this type of work his entire adult life. When you look at Dane, you see wide, strong shoulders, muscular arms, rough, calloused hands, <clears throat> and a vice-like grip, sun-darkened face and neck. That's what happens when you're on construction sites. Remember, except for Jesus' final three years, he was a carpenter his whole life. And, and carpentry in those days was different from carpentry in these days. I mean, it was a lot tougher. Carpenters didn't ride around in pickup trucks with leather seats and Bluetooth back then. In those days, there weren't forklifts and modern scaffolding. It was a massively labor-intensive industry. From what we read in history, carpenters did their own masonry and stonework most of the time, not unlike my friend Dane. They often had to go into the forest themselves and cut down trees that they needed for the woodwork. Here's the reality. Had Jesus not been physically strong, he wouldn't have lasted in that trade because it was too physically demanding. Beyond that, we read in the scriptures that one time, Jesus threw a bunch of money changers out of the temple for their financial shenanigans. The text said that when he confronted them, he turned the tables over and told them to get out. The scripture says they fled. Now he must have been a rather imposing person physically because there was money at stake here. Had he not been, people would have probably said, yeah, you and who else's mother? And challenged him. But they didn't. They fled. The Bible tells us how far Jesus would walk to get from town to town. Sometimes 10, 15, 20 miles or even more up and down hills through rocks and trees. This was in the Middle Eastern heat. And what about near the end of his life when he was savagely beaten and then flogged with a whip? A whip that had metal pieces in it that ripped open his back. And then after that, a hundred pound cross was strapped to his back. 
He had to carry it through the streets of Jerusalem and up a hill called Calvary. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you could have done that. I couldn't. Make no mistake about it. Jesus was a very strong man. But his strength was not merely physical. He had mental strength as well. Mental tenacity, mental toughness. He was absolutely clear about his identity and his mission. Nothing could seduce him, distract him, or derail him. It takes a lot of internal strength, mental toughness to stay on mission for any period of time, to resist the easier path, to avoid the side streets of comfort and pleasure. Jesus had that inner strength. He displayed it all throughout his life, and he displayed it all the way to the end. Remember when the nails were being pounded into his hands and his feet? And he was stripped naked and propped up for people to spit at and mock? A man of lesser strength would have probably screamed, Who needs this? And put a fast end to the redemptive plan, which he had the power to do. But Jesus didn't. He didn't do that. Jesus was very tough physically and very, very tough. Tough as steel mentally. He was also very strong emotionally. Jesus, among other things, was a teacher, you know? Now, those of you who have ever had to teach, you know how emotionally demanding teaching can be. Especially if you have an important message to give. It takes an emotional toll on you. Take it one step further. If your important message is resisted or refused, it's, it's extremely demanding emotionally on the teacher. Before coming to Emmanuel, I was on staff at a church in Rockford. And um, my last Sunday in that church, the senior pastor gave me the opportunity to preach. And when he did, I remember thinking, wow, I get to preach on my last Sunday. I guess I better make it good. Whatever it is, you know, that I want to say to these people, after five years of ministry, this is my chance. And I, I took that as a real honor, actually, and a privilege. And so I took that message maybe even a little bit more seriously than others I had preached in preparing it. And I really felt that the Lord had laid on my heart to, to speak a message that, that I, was, I was hoping would, would greatly encourage the congregation, but also would have a degree of challenge in it. I'd gotten to know that congregation pretty well. I'd been there five years. And I loved, we, Christy and I both, we, we loved those people. And I felt that after that length of time, I had, I had, I had uh, earned some credibility. I could, I could preach this message. And basically what it had to do with was this church was kind of at a crossroads. And they had some very, very important decisions to make as to whether or not or, or, or how effective or not they would really be going forward in, in reaching people for Jesus, rather than just kind of staying inwardly focused. So I brought a message to, to just challenge them on that, and to try to challenge them 
to make the right decision, which was going to be tough because it was going to mean sacrificing some preferences and doing some things that weren't comfortable, making some hard decisions. And when I got through preaching that message, many people were very affirming and, and were very gracious thanked me and and I was really grateful to the Lord because I felt like he had he had used me on that last day with them but there was a man who made a very clear point to come up to me following the service that day and this man was not happy and he let me know in no uncertain terms, that he thought my message was completely inappropriate. And he did not appreciate it. He said I should have never, ever brought that message. He was disappointed and said it cast a shadow of doubt on my entire ministry there. Now, as a teacher, when you hear stuff like that or sometimes read stuff like that, there's this little toll that it takes. Now, please understand here. I didn't tell you that to gain any kind of sympathy because, frankly, that man's words didn't really ding me too much. I mean, it was my last day at that church, and frankly, I I would have expected it coming from that guy. You know, I mean, maybe he decided that day to take my picture out of his wallet. No big deal. No big deal. You know why? You know why it's no big deal? Because I'm no big deal. I'm no big deal. The reason I bring it up is because Jesus was a big deal. Jesus is a big deal. He's the second person of the Trinity, the smartest man who ever lived, the most powerful, capable, compelling teacher that ever walked on this planet. He taught not just information. He taught with passion and laid his heart out bare to try and inspire people and educate people about the kingdom of God. His message was met with flat-out defiance from the entire religious establishment of his day. They asked him trick questions to embarrass him. They lied about what he had taught, spread half-truths about him to discredit him. And sometimes, even his close friends couldn't handle it. They couldn't take the challenge level. And at one point, many of them, the Bible says, did an about-face and they left. This is the point that I'm making with this. That takes an unbelievable emotional toll on a teacher. The kind that makes teachers want to say, you know what, forget this. Jesus never caved in. He never modified the message. He didn't lower the challenge level. He said, the Father sent me to proclaim a message. I will proclaim it whether it's received or rejected, whether people applaud me or arrest me and beat me. Jesus was tough physically and tough mentally and very tough emotionally. What about uh, moral strength? I mean, read about the private lives of almost any famous leader or teacher, and when you do, fasten your seatbelts. In many cases, it's pretty disappointing. Think of some of the most celebrated presidents of our country in history. Read about what they were like when they were, you know, off stage, off camera. Even read about 
the private lives of some of the greatest spiritual leaders who've ever lived in history. You don't have to dig too deep before your balloon pops. Even top religious leaders of our day would have to admit that occasionally ego interferes with their ministry just a tad. Greed creeps in a little. Fame and fortune gets a grip. A battle with a secret temptation is lost. Jesus was completely different on this point. Jesus exhibited the moral strength to overcome every temptation that came his way. If Jesus was playing baseball, he batted a thousand. One time, his detractors were so mad about something that he said, and they wanted in the worst way to discredit him. Jesus humbly approached them and said, if I've done anything wrong, if I've done anything wrong, I'd be more than happy to have you point it out to me. And the Bible says that not a single person could think of a single thing that they could point out that he had done wrong morally. They stood in total silence. You best not try that. I wouldn't. Jesus had no moral blemishes. Even as a highly visible leader and teacher with all the pressure and stress that comes with it. I mean, that requires enormous moral strength. And he had it. Whatever you think of Jesus today, if you believe him to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world or not, don't believe the pictures you see in some of the movies or on television of some emaciated, starry-eyed, flaky character. He was perhaps the strongest person who's ever walked on this planet, physically, mentally, emotionally, and morally. Second, as we continue to look through this window, Jesus is a person of deep sensitivity. Sensitivity? Really? What's that all about? How does that sit together with strength? Seems kind of odd, huh? You know, usually, people of exceptional strength show little or no capacity for sensitivity. The two are often mutually exclusive. I mean, tough generals form a battle plan knowing full well that there might be, you know, a 10 or 20% casualty rate. They give the orders to go ahead anyway, to take the hill. It's their job to do that kind of thing, and very few tears are shed. Most generals are high on the strength quota and low on the sensitivity quota. Or powerful CEOs announce there's going to be another 50 or 500 or 5,000 layoffs. And they will often do it without a trace of emotion. It's strictly business. We had to make the numbers work. That's what they say. We don't often think of great strength and deep sensitivity coexisting in the same person. But they did in Jesus. They really, really did. The Bible records that, uh, that the man who had all the power in him, the power to halt the wind and calm the raging seas, thoroughly enjoyed taking little children on his lap talking with them, listening to them, and blessing them. The one who by his power healed the sick 
and made the lame walk and the blind see was the same one who, when he traveled through certain towns, would look at people living destructive lifestyles. And he'd pause. And he'd say words like these. Here's another city with people in it who are wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. And the scripture says sometimes he'd sit down maybe on a rock and have a good cry. Hey, if you're ever in a jam and you need to memorize a a Bible verse quick, um, I got one for you. It's the shortest one in the New Testament. It's John 11.35. Let's say it together. Jesus wept. You already got it. This strong, strong, strong man came to the graveside of a friend who had recently passed away, and he cried. The one assigned the most important mission in the world, the one whose public teaching often attracted thousands of people, would often sneak off to the side and meet one-on-one with broken people grieving people, confused people, troubled people, and forgotten people. It would frustrate those following him, those walking with him. They'd be like, why? Why is he doing this? They'd be exasperated with it. They couldn't understand it. His was sensitivity of another kind, a kind the world had never seen before, a kind that the people around him didn't understand. A kind this world has really never seen since. His sensitivity knew no color, no age, no gender, no social or financial status. His sensitivity was not contrived, but was consistent and universal. He deeply loved and cared for people. And it was evident in his look, in his words, his touch, his time. That was Jesus' sensitivity. He was one of a kind when it came to strength, and he was one of a kind when it came to sensitivity. Now the third thing that you're really only going to learn when you get up close and personal with Jesus. And this may be one of the things about Jesus that I'm most intrigued by. Jesus lived a life of focused simplicity. Jesus lived a life of focused simplicity. Usually the trajectory of a powerful, competent person's life is toward greater levels of complexity. Their schedule gets increasingly complicated. They uh, become insulated so normal people can't get close to them anymore. And pretty soon they're totally out of touch with the very people that they once led and felt close to. Their schedules are packed with complexity. You know this. You've seen it. Just like I have. Well, it never, ever happened to Jesus. And it could have. But it never did because he wouldn't let it happen. He made another choice, a radical choice. Despite his enormous following and despite his enormous popularity, he chose a simple lifestyle, a lifestyle that enabled him to stay accessible to regular, normal people. He walked the dusty roads like everyone else walked. No chariot, no limo. He ate the foods that the common people ate. He often stayed in the homes of friends to keep expenses, though. He kept his schedule flexible. He was extremely approachable so that normal people could talk to him almost any time. And when he died, he left just a single earthly possession, a blood-stained robe. Those stains on his robe washed away the sins in your life and mine. And again, you, you, you have to wonder why. why. Why God's son? One who has all the resources of 
heaven at his disposal. Why? Why did he choose such an extreme level of simplicity? Why on that one occasion did he throw a towel over his arm, fill a bowl with water, and wash the feet of his followers? I'll tell you why. Jesus' commitment to simplicity was to establish the value once and for all in everyone's mind that people matter more than things matter. A life of simple servanthood in the name of God the Father is a life much preferred over a life of complexity and busyness. Always after more money, more position, more pleasure, more fame, more power. His lifestyle of, of simplicity taught without words this basic message. That Christianity is about loving the Father and making yourself available as a servant and lover of other human beings. Jesus' lifestyle said it all. It's just that simple. Have you ever considered? Have you ever considered those kinds of things about Jesus? How well do you really know Jesus of Nazareth? I can recall a time when I felt sadness that I didn't have a chance to get to know Jesus in person like the disciples. You know, to experience what they experienced. And I've actually been tempted at times to use that as an excuse not to get to know Jesus better. But here's, here's a reality. You can learn to relate to him like his followers did in that day. Because after his death, which provided redemption for the world, he rose from the dead and he is still alive. By his spirit, the Holy Spirit, he can be related to by anyone, anywhere, any time. As you get to know Jesus of Nazareth, his strength will slowly get infused into the weak parts of your life. His sensitivity will find its way into those icky, unkind, insensitive places in your life. His simplicity will slowly replace the scattered, crazy, complex approach that most of us take in our lives. I will never forget as a freshman in high school hearing a young 20-something youth pastor say to me, say to me personally, I want to help you get to know Jesus in a real way. That, that was the first invitation of its kind to me. You know, even as a kid who'd grown up in a church, my understanding of Jesus up to that point was that he was a remote historical finger, figure. God, yes. But not somebody who was available and accessible for a friendship with me. And I decided to take that 20-something youth pastor named Greg up on his offer. And as a 14-year-old, began getting to know Jesus in a real way. I started sort of communicating with him, friend to friend. I began reading my Bible from a whole different perspective. Actually, I just began reading my Bible. I learned that by his spirit, Jesus is present with me right here and right now. Over time, in the years that have followed, I've continued to develop my friendship with Jesus and what it looks like because it doesn't necessarily look the same for me as it would for you or someone else. I've learned how at times to shut off the radio in my car and talk to the one who travels with me. Throughout the years, I have felt the friendship of Jesus in my life as kind of an accompanying presence and kind of an ever-present help. I feel his presence often when I'm up here leading worship, singing and playing, and on days, like today, on days like today when I'm speaking. 
I can feel the friendship of Jesus saying, you're doing what I gifted you to do, Kelly. Keep going. And sometimes, sometimes he tells me to stop. I feel his presence when I'm battling through a round of golf. Sometimes I sense his presence while I'm doing errands. I get a sense of his presence doing most things in life, even the mundane. I've learned over the years, especially in the last several years, how to hear him speaking to me more clearly. Mostly I I hear from him by his words in the Bible. Even though the consistency of my relationship with Jesus can ebb and flow, the more I spend time in his word, the more I find that he brings his word to my mind at just the right time. And that's one way he communicates with me. I've also learned to listen to his quiet whispers by his spirit, where he encourages or directs or convicts or affirms. And after 30 plus years of this, there's this thing I still feel about Jesus. It's not the only thing, but I still feel sadness. I still at times feel sadness. And I feel sadness because I know that some of you don't really know Jesus of Nazareth in the way that I'm describing that he can be known. Many of you are Christ followers and you struggle to live your faith. And you're trying very hard to be a good Boy Scout or Girl Scout, which is better than being a bad one. I get it. For some of you here today, it's, it's, it's really more like this gradual adoption of some sort of religious lifestyle than it is with actually relating and the ongoing dialogue that can mark a true friendship with Jesus. Some of you have no conversations that go on with him throughout your day. Some of you, frankly, look alone in your Christian life. That's not the way it was supposed to be. You have this strength in Christ available to you, just a conversation away, an ever-present help, and a friend who has promised to walk with you no matter how uncertain the world gets. I mean, if it gets real uncertain and somebody blows something up and you happen to be near it, you get transported immediately to be with Jesus. Forever. Where's the fear? What's that about? Some of you are lonely. And you're trying to fill your loneliness by doing crazy things. And it's because you don't have a friend called Jesus of Nazareth. Some of you are out trying to climb ladders being important to people, and you're already important to the only one who truly matters, Jesus. You've got to get to know him. You've just got to get to know him. You've got to talk with him. You've got to listen for him. It's the single most dynamic part of the Christian faith, this ongoing dialogue. This sort of mystical relating to the one named Jesus. In a world full of religious beliefs, only Christianity offers this. Only Jesus. I'm going to give you just a moment to try your hand at this. I just want to give you a brief moment, and you can... You can put this into practice later when you have more time. But would you just right now bow with me? Close your eyes and just bow with me. I want to ask you right now to have a very, very brief but meaningful conversation quietly with this remarkable person of strength and sensitivity and simplicity. And if it's awkward for you, just make that your first admission. Say, Jesus, this is really awkward for me. I don't know how to do this. I feel strange doing it, but I want to try. Tell him 
a couple concerns that you have. What's, what's on your heart right now? What's on your mind right now? And then just quietly listen. We'll give this just a little bit of time and then I'll have a few more words. I want to challenge you to spend some time this week meditating on the person of Jesus. This is Holy Week. We look toward Good Friday. We look toward Easter Sunday. A perfect week to devote time. And I would challenge you time every day to meditate on the person of Jesus. And here's how I'm going to ask you to do that. You, uh, some of you were, that were in here at the very beginning, you tried to draw a picture of Palm Sunday and you have that white sheet of paper. And those of you who weren't in here, you still have that white sheet of paper attached with the cards you received on the way in. Take that white sheet of paper, whether you have the drawing, that drawing can serve as a reminder. You can put that somewhere visible. But on the other side, write down these two scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. And Philippians 2, 1 through 11. <clears throat> There's a lot more I could have been put on here, but this I think is very doable, very attainable. Two amazing passages of Scripture that describe Jesus. This isn't to mention, you know, the whole gospel accounts of his life and other Scriptures, but, but these two I think are, are, are great for you just this week. Every day, read these. Read them over and over. Meditate on them. Let Scripture speak to you about who this Jesus is. Will you do that this week? Maybe for some of you, this is going to be the beginning, like a new beginning of starting this kind of a relationship with Jesus more up close and personal. And for others of you, you're just going to continue in what you have discovered to be the most amazing, significant relationship that you have. Jesus is here. He's there. He's wherever you are, and he's waiting. And he so wants you to know him. He knows you. He knows everything about you. Everything. And he loves you so much. And he wants, all he wants is you to know him. Will you do that? Will you begin that this week? I'm going to have the guys come out. I've asked them to, to do a song here at the end. And what I'd really like is for this song to be our closing prayer. Could, let's make this song our prayer today, right now. And, and maybe this song could be your prayer in this week. You can look it up on YouTube or whatever. And listen to this song more this week as you spend time with Jesus and you get ready for Easter. But this is a wonderful song that just expresses it so well. So let's let this be our prayer. And let's listen to this. It's called Give Me Jesus. Jesus.